I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior. I invite you to join me in prayer as we worship together today. Let us pray. Eternal and loving God, we pray for your guidance in this time and in these days we are living through. When we fail to see the reality of the situations going on around us because our mind is already made up, create in us a clean heart, O oh God. When our ears hear but our minds do not understand, create in us a clean heart, O oh God. When truth stares us in the face while we choose to deny reality and remain deceived, please create in us a clean heart, O oh God. And we would further ask you to clean not only our hearts, O oh God, but renew a right spirit within us. Amen. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome as he records them in Romans 11, 1 through 2a and 29 through 32. I ask then, has God rejected this people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. For us, the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all persons to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Would you pray with me again, please? Patient and caring God, we are often blind to your presence among us. When we find ourselves in the uncomfortableness of trouble in, as life changes and plans fall apart, we look for an angle rather than an angel to somehow turn things around. We like to think we control our own destiny and when you do not respond to our situation in the way we want and when we want it, we thank you to be absent. Have you forgotten us? Through faith, though, we know you desire to carry us along life's stream on the current of your love, even as we try to paddle our own canoes. Forgive our blindness to seeing you at work. Forgive our deafness in hearing you speak and our resistance to your call to come follow Jesus. Take us, 
please remake us in the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray as he taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Gospel Scripture reading for today is from Matthew, the 15th chapter, and we read these words. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This morning, I'd like to uh, begin by saying thank you to Dave Halling for sharing the last couple of weeks while I took some uh, time personally. I also thank you for your cards uh, supporting my family in this time as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm grateful to you. And now for the sermon. Elton Trueblood's book, The Humor of Christ, says a Christian 
devoid of humor is a worthless person to have around. And anyone who attempts to paint the Christian faith as being without humor is unaware of the life of Jesus. He then goes on in the book to show Jesus was a man who embraced all of life, even humor, and would be shocked by the long faces of so many people who call themselves Christian today. He mentions in that book the story of the Canaanite woman, which is our text for the morning. You know, taken at face value, the reply of Jesus to the woman was rude and insulting at best. Yet in the response of Jesus, we find the answer to one of humankind's most troubling questions. What does it mean to have faith? You know, this is the only time Jesus ventured into Gentile territory. We're told he goes there to escape the clamor of events which surrounded his going to Galilee to prepare himself for the cross which would come later. But even in a foreign territory, he was not immune from those who needed help. We find Jesus and the disciples walking along the border of Tyre and Sidon. The animosity between Israelites and these neighbors had a long history. Like many feuds, the parties begin to see one another as inferior, unworthy. It's the kind of demonization that fuels racism and slavery and colonialism, where those in power, sad to say often white folk, come to see others as savages, barbarians, dogs. A desperate, foolish, Canaanite woman ran up to them begging and pleading for the healing of her demon-possessed daughter. I suspect the disciples wondering who really needs the help, the daughter or the mother. But Jesus surprisingly ignores the woman. He seemed to affirm their worst assumptions about the woman. Her persistence was causing a scene. So no one of them, so one of them said to him, Let's figure out how to ditch this lady. She's making us uncomfortable. Usually, in other experiences, this is where Jesus would put the disciples in their place and everyone learns a lesson about compassion and diversity. But Jesus doesn't. Instead, he says that his ministry was not for her. She wasn't an Israelite. She wasn't included. So she drops to her knees in an act of worship and begs Jesus, help me. You know, there are two things that stand out in this story for us today, I think. First is the silence of Jesus. Then as now, to avoid speaking when one is spoken to was considered rude. Yet when the woman spoke to Jesus, he remained silent. Why? Well, you know, sometimes we're silent because we're shocked and speechless. Or we may be embarrassed or maybe we really don't have anything to say. Or it could be that we may not want to say anything at all. Jesus, being the great psychologist he was, sometimes used silence as all good counselors do. He tested her to give her an opportunity to express her true feelings. Silence is a tremendous power when used widely, wisely. My dad knew how to use silence. I was uh, never more fearful than when he was silent. You know, at least when a person speaks, you can know what they're thinking. It seems to me that Jesus was silent in order to probe the feelings of his own heart. Back at Mount Sinai, God had called the Hebrews to be his priests to the world. But they forgot. And they proceeded to develop a henotheism, which is the concept of one God for one people. And this is the outline and the story of the Old Testament. The struggle of God trying to reach a closed-minded people with the idea of a monotheism, the concept of a one God for all people, is the story of the Old Testament. This mindset of henotheism, the idea that 
Hebrew was special in the sight of God was in conflict with the understanding of Jesus. Jesus reached out to all persons. Remember the Samaritan woman at the well? He reached out to the least, the lost, and he one time even told a story in which the hero was a good Samaritan. Now, the next thing worse to being a foreigner was to be a woman in that day. They had not even heard that a woman could think and make decisions on her own. They didn't believe a woman was smart enough to vote, much less stand up for herself. Their prayer book contained the prayer, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has not made me a woman. Can you imagine? Well, in this experience with a Canaanite woman, Jesus is caught between his cultural upbringing and his concept of God for all persons. So the silence is golden in this situation, for she continued to follow him. And the disciples were so embarrassed, they begged him to send her away as soon as possible. No compassion in their attitude. Rather, it's one of getting rid of the nuisance. Well, disciples of Jesus can still have problems with that today because we want to be rid of the nuisances in life. Persons who are different from us. Those of a different culture and or color make us uncomfortable because we do not understand them and so we're threatened by them. Well, somehow this woman senses the struggle and in desperation kneels before Jesus and asks very clearly, Lord, help me. Now, no one had ever called him Lord before. It had connotations that, that shook him. So he turns to her and says, well, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the pet dogs. In that day, to call a person a dog was the greatest insult that one could make. You see, dogs were not man's best friend, but were rather the slinking scavengers of the streets. So to understand this statement, one must look at her reply to him. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's tables. She's saying that while she may be no better than a dog, even the dogs get something, no matter how small that something may be. I believe the clue to Christ's spirit in the entire episode is to be found in his ready reply to her. Woman, great is your faith. Let it be for you as you wish. The daughter is healed. Now, friends, I don't think it's what he said, but rather how he said it and what he did that made the difference. I wonder if she wasn't the only one who caught the twinkle in his eye. So may I call your attention to five important things to reflect on from this scripture today? First, this woman loved her daughter and wanted her health more than anything, even to the point of her own personal embarrassment and harassing Jesus. Love can be the door to unlock great possibilities for another person. We know how much God loves us. The question for us is, how much do we love? Second, this woman grew in her encounter with Jesus. She first called him son of David, but ended by calling him Lord. She began by following and ended by kneeling before him. You know, we're invited to grow in our encounters with Jesus. So every time we worship or attend a Bible study, we're invited to grow in our faith. I hope you are planning to be part of our opportunities to learn and grow through Zoom and other classes when we're able to meet in person again. I've never understood why people do not attend Sunday school and Bible studies because of the class relationship, but also because of the learning. Third, we discover that this woman had an indomitable persistence. Jesus was her only hope and she was not going to let the opportunity slip away. It's no accident that many people get to know God better in times of crisis. Fourth, she was cheerful even in her trouble. She had a quick brain and energy. 
Brains and energy are needed in our faith journey. Jesus needs quick, clear brains for his work. It's not enough to have a heart of gold and a head full of feathers. That's a very poor building material for a mature faith. This woman was willing to learn. She was willing to ask for help. And I believe many of us would improve our stress level if we would simply admit we do not know it all and ask for help. Fifth, Jesus teaches us that it is Christ-like to accept people where they are, not where we want them to be. We must never forget that reality. People are more important than anything, and in Jesus Christ we are all equal, no matter what our life experience may be. And that's why your preacher will never turn anyone away, because every person is kin to me as a person of faith. Every person deserves to be treated with respect. You know, friends, God does not look to see how we're dressed, the color of our skin, the country of our birth, or our status in any way. God loves us no matter what. And if you don't believe that, then you and God have a problem far greater than the problem you and I have. The circle had been drawn so as to shut folk out who were different. But this Canaanite woman had the wit and the daring to tug at the circle, so she was included. And when she reminded Jesus that even the dogs got crumbs, Jesus had nothing but praise for her faith. He said her plea would be answered. You see, this woman asked Jesus for just a little of what he had to offer. She believed a little was all she needed. We have faith in ourselves, in our country, in our family, and in our friends. And that's appropriate. But remember, faith can provide no more help than what we believe in. Often we find ourselves with a lot of faith and a little, when all we really need is a little faith in Jesus Christ. Paul speaks to this in the passage from Romans earlier. Some people were wondering if people can ever fall out of their standing with God. Can the circle ever be drawn so that those who are included can't be included any longer? But Paul reminded them Israel was not chosen because they were the only ones God loved. They were chosen to make God's name known throughout the world. God's love is universal in scope. There are no lines of separation to be drawn. Paul reminds them and us that God's love and grace and mercy are abundant and always there for us as revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one great solution to our problems. And no one's ever been able to fully measure his help. To follow Jesus may look like choosing the lesser of two ways in life. It takes humility and may include a cross. It's the lesser amount with a greater value that answers our initial question. What does it mean to have faith? It means to follow a woman who had a little faith. She acted upon. She trusted Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, would you rather have a lot of a little or a little of a lot? Amen.
as we close this service today, may the presence and reality of Jesus Christ continue to nurture your heart and your faith that we might grow in our understanding of God's love for all persons, even those who are not a part of our inner circle. Go in peace to serve Christ in your neighbor. Amen. on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. my solemn vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally let there be peace on earth and let